Uh, we are delighted to be launching uh, an event that has been long in the planning, um, uh, the Arts of, of Asylum event series, Strengthening Community by Building a City of Asylum in Rochester. Uh, today, we're going to be hearing a wonderful poetry reading and conversation uh, with Tuin Das, moderated by Alison Myers, um, and we'll introduce you to both of them shortly. And we're also going to talk to you about the context of City of Asylum, what that project is, what its relevance to Rochester is, um, and how we might think about supporting Rochester's uh, creative and activist uh, organizations by supporting Supporting writers globally, especially those who are um, at risk um, uh, of persecution and oppression. Um, we'll be thinking during our three-part series, the first of which is, is tonight and, and two more to come, um, about various different art forms and various different projects that are underway in Rochester um, and around the United States uh, to engage in creative placemaking through supporting artists and, and creative across a range of genres. And by creative placemaking, we're really thinking about the ways in which we can support neighborhoods, support local residents, um, and, and lead to en enriched and, and just lives um, through connecting arts to, to local neighborhoods. Um, and with that in mind, um, it's my great pleasure to, um, to hand over to Roberta Schwartz this evening, uh, who has been the, the guiding light uh, for the uh, idea of establishing a city of asylum uh, in Rochester, um, uh, and uh, brought this project to the attention of uh, my, myself here at SUNY Geneseo and Michael Jacobs at Monroe Community College. Um, uh, we were able to get some funding from the wonderful Bringing Theory to Practice organization um, to support uh, the work of, of, of trying to raise awareness for and explore potential for creating that city of asylum. Um, Roberta, would you tell us more about the venture, please? Sure, well, thank you so much, Lytton, and good evening and welcome to the Arts of Asylum series. We're so glad that you're joining us. And uh, as Lytton mentioned, my name is Roberta Schwartz and I'm dedicated to establishing a city of asylum here in Rochester. Especially for those of you who are new to the concept, allow me to share a bit of its history with you. From a personal point of view, my initial fascination with this project began when I visited my beloved childhood weaving teacher, Diane Samuels one of the original founders of City of Asylum in Pittsburgh. After not seeing one another for more than 30 years, we reunited in Pittsburgh about four years ago, and she gave me a personal tour of her studio and the City of Asylum located in the north side of the city. As a homegrown Pittsburgher, I fondly remembered that neighborhood because my closest high school friend's father ran Gus and Yaya's ice ball stand there. It felt comforting to know that the ice ball stand is still standing and that it is still manned by Gus. I was especially delighted and amazed to witness and experience the spirit of the arts that now pervades the neighborhood there. Diane and I walked through the urban neighborhood featuring a broad array of Victorian architectural styles. This is where she and her husband, Henry Reese, live and work. I listened to her offer a brief history of this relatively young Steel City landmark. In 2004, City of Asylum Pittsburgh opened with a mission to provide sanctuary to literary writers who were exiled and under threat of persecution. Since then, this fertile organization has grown and enriched the entire Pittsburgh community with a series of houses for use by writers in exile each with a text-based artwork on the facade. City of Asylum at Alphabet City contains their offices, a permanent home for arts programming, all of which is free to the public, a bookstore featuring works in translation, a neighborhood restaurant, and a beautiful garden open to the public. It's a hub for artistic community, um, partnerships that express really humanity's best creative impulses. And it's, and I quote, a place where Pittsburgh meets the world and the world meets Pittsburgh. The City of Asylum provides sanctuary to endangered writers, musicians, and artists so that they can continue to create and their voices are not silenced. This organization supplies free housing, travel expenses, healthcare, and it also brings together and builds community by supporting new and challenging cultural experiences led by local, national, and international voices. These free programs are easily accessible and unpretentious. That artistic vibrancy, that opportunity to share cultural experiences 
And that emphasis on protecting world-class artists in need is something worth bringing to Rochester. In support of that, my husband and I have furnished uh, and purchased a house in the city of Rochester in the Swilberg neighborhood. We will make this house available rent-free to an exiled literary writer under threat of persecution. To get us up and running, we need a not-for-profit status from the IRS. And that has been an extremely daunting task during these tempestuous times. Josh Gwalb and Autumn Young of the law firm Harder and Seacrest have generously offered their services to assist us with filing our application. Mike Jacobs, Dean of Humanities and Social Sciences at Monroe Community College and Lytton Smith, Director of the Center for Integrative Learning at SUNY Geneseo have put together this series, which is supported with a grant from Bringing Theory to Practice. Folks from the City of Asylum in Pittsburgh have repeatedly offered their support and assistance for our plans to bring a City of Asylum to Rochester. As a longtime grant writer, I intend to work hard in this capacity to bring funding support to this endeavor. That will take place just as soon as we receive our not-for-profit status. This Arts of Asylum series is a virtual interactive forum featuring distinguished writers, musicians, and artists, along with community partners serving refugees and asylum-seeking populations to raise awareness about the City of Asylum Network, to help create a new City of Asylum in Rochester, it's the fifth United States City of Asylum location, and finally, to explore how the City of Asylum in Rochester will engage in creative placemaking to support local communities. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We look forward to your engagement in bringing the City of Asylum to Rochester. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Roberta, and thank you for all you're doing with your vision for the City of Asylum in Rochester and the generosity that you're showing uh, to the city uh, and to uh, uh, persecuted writers and artists. Um, it's my great pleasure now to be um, introducing um, Alison Myers of Writers and Books, who will be um, uh, with us to moderate a conversation with Tuin Das, a current resident at City of Asylum Pittsburgh, who has first-hand experience of, of what the City of Asylum Network um, means for writers and for local communities. Um, you'll have the option to um, put questions you may have to, to Tuin and to Alison um, about Tuin's poetry, uh, about the experience of moving to the United States and more, um, and Alison will be keeping uh, an eye on on the, the questions so that, the, that we can be truly interactive here. Um, Alison herself uh, is a, a wonderful aficionado of the City of Asylum to have with us and a wonderful expert on all things um, literary and just. Uh, she's a veteran nonprofit leader with previous appointments at Carve Cannon Foundation, where she was the executive, executive director from 2006 to 2016 um, and the Hillstead Museum, among other places. Um, she served as director of development of the community of literary magazines and presses um, and for many years also owned and managed an independent bookstore in Connecticut. So she's seen the literary world from all angles and sustained the literary world from all angles and we're grateful for the efforts she's put together. Um, she's also in a Pushcart Prize nominated poet, fiction writer and essayist in her own right. You could read her work in many journals and anthologies and we're delighted Alison to have you with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the introduction Lytton. Um, it's my privilege to introduce Tuin Das, a poet, activist, political columnist, short story writer and essayist currently living in Pittsburgh. Tuin left his home country, Bangladesh, in 2016. Considered by critics a significant poet of Generation Zero, he was involved in the Little Magazine movement and over the last 20 years has had poetry, criticism, articles, short stories, and opinion columns broadly published in Bangladesh and West Bengal in India. Since 2013, Tuin has been the target of fundamentalist militant groups who have murdered secular writers and activists in Bangladesh. Instead of protecting him, the police collected and examined his writings for anti-Islamist statements to use against him. To save his own life, he had no choice but to go into hiding and find a way out of Bangladesh. He left his country in April, 2016. Tuin is now an ICORN writer in residence of City of Asylum in Pittsburgh. He is the author of eight poetry books in his native language. His full length collection, Exile Poems, focusing on his life as an exiled writer, 
is forthcoming from Bridge and Tunnel Books. His work has appeared in Words Without Borders, The Bear Life Review, Immigrant Report, The Offing, Epiphany, Where Am I From, The WAIF Project, and elsewhere. Tuen, welcome. Please start us off by reading poems from Exile Poems. Thank you so much. Just to give me one. I'm going to do my share screen here. Uh, can you see my uh, slide? So uh, I did this poems after coming to uh, Pittsburgh. Uh, these poems are from a manuscript called Exile Poems. And in these poems, I highlighted uh, my time in Pittsburgh, uh, my relationship with the neighborhoods, the river of Pittsburgh, and also a missing home. So uh, this is the first poem I'm going to read. And I uh, got this idea to write this poem uh, about uh, when the writers were getting killed in Bangladesh and I decided to leave the country. And on the way of the uh, airport, I got the idea to write this one. All the writers were living under their threats. So why should I step back in my land? The thought kept floating up, a question like the corpse of a refugee lying on the coast by the sea. Its existence is irrelevant next to the vast expanse of water. I had wanted to be that minority who would be the last to flee the country. Two, then I did leave my country. I abandoned everything, my entire contemptible past, passing on my journey, the silent sky, the river of fear and the farmland, full of the harvest of death. When I saw those who were sleeping at midnight in the Abu Dhabi International Airport, I thought of walking them to say, you are my own, each and every one of you but my restless feet pressing down on the constantly moving escalator found no opportunity to pause. This is the first poem. This is the poem about uh, my first view of Pittsburgh. Out of the Fort Pitt Tunnel, my first view of Pittsburgh, the way we cling to when you love her, is how these three rivers joined with my feelings. On Samsonia way, the American robins warble sweetly on the wires. You have come here as well, birds, to welcome me. The trees in West Park give me shade all summer. No one but me lives in my apartment from the December window I watch the first snowfall, a beautiful melancholy day, like a great painting on a white canvas. That day, I don't even want to know the names of the flowers in the store, just that I love them the way we love someone at first sight. I write these things in letters sent across countries to the new addresses of my friends. There is a country within each of us, neighborhood, neighbors walk their dogs in the park. In the morning, I wait for the 54 bus on Arch Street. I work at a call center. When I talk to people in Pittsburgh, my country is always within me. Some ask, where are you from? Do you miss your home? 
I have borne my country from afar. I tell them, do you know how light a country is, like a, the feather on robins. The wind blows south from the north, and I remember the Bay of Bengal. There is a country within each of us. I, th I think I have these Excel poems. Thank you for reading these first poems for us, Tuin. Um, as you have heard from me, I'm such a fan of your poems. Um, going through your manuscript was a first time experience for me. And I returned to several of your poems over and over again. In their seeming simpli simplicity, there's such a complexity of experience and feeling beneath them. And they all uh, deserve many readings. In a recent interview, you said, I am a Bengali and Bangladeshi first. Some people want to define me by my religion, but I want to be known by my culture, which is Bengali. When I was defined as a Hindu, it would affect me a lot because I always like to think of myself as a Bengali. And you went on to say, I've always wished for a Renaissance where religion would not define our culture and a person's identity is not defined by his or her religious beliefs. Bengalis have a very old heritage of being a culturally rich, secular and non-communal society. It was deeply rooted inside me that I'm a Bengali. I've always wished for a Renaissance. Can you speak to how your identity as a Bengali comes through in your poems? and tell us a bit about what role poetry can play in catalyzing the Renaissance you long for. Yeah, so uh, for me, language uh, plays, a, plays a, big, uh, a big role because when I grew up, I heard about the greatest, the history of the greatest language, Bengali language movement. And there is a great, greatest Bengali language movement in Bangladesh in 1952. Uh, at that time, we were part of Pakistan. Uh, it was not Bangladesh, it was East Pakistan. And at that, uh, the, the ruler the, uh, the ruler of Pakistan just said us, we have to speak in their language, not in our language. So it was a great, uh, uh, there was a uh, big protest and uh, so many people were killed by Pakistani police. So that is the 21st, of February, 1952, uh, in, in 19, this, this is a uh, red, red, red letter day and uh, it is a very uh, emotional day for, a, for Bangladeshi or Bengali people. In 1999, uh, United Nations declared this day as an international mother language day. So when I grew up, uh, so in our Bangladesh, there are so many uh, monuments to honor the martyrs of the language movement. It, it is everywhere. The monuments are in, uh, in all uh, cities, at the schools, colleges, and there are so many uh, cultural events to uh, honor this day on uh, 21st February. So when I was a kid, I always go there. I spend my time at the cultural events. So that means I grew up with this, uh, even some about the language movement, I hear a lot. So, so that, that plays a big part for that. And, and when, uh, sometimes when I was thinking who I am, so then I feel I, I am a Bengali first. We have our own language and also we have our own culture and that is our root. Uh, in my poems, uh, I try to always uh, keep those uh, notes, like cultural notes in my poems. Like I wrote a poem about uh, Bengali language movement, or like we have other cultural notes, like we have uh, fear, uh, village fear on, on our uh, first Bengali new year, we have our like own calendar. And, new, and we uh, celebrate that day uh, 
in Bangladesh. So I wrote about that, and but I think uh, for religion, I think there are so many uh, people who do um, who misinterpret the the religion and try to divide people. I so I have that experience, and as a minority, I I was experienced that, and so that means I had that trauma. So when people uh, try to say me, oh, he's a Hindu, so I that trauma triggered into me. So but I feel I can uh, get my comfort when people say he's a Bengali. So that is my identity and I, I belong uh, that part of like physical world or also that part of psychological world I live. Like, like when at, still at Pittsburgh, when I close my door, I am at, I am at home, uh, Bengali language, Bengali song, at, in my mind always, I don't feel I am uh, in abroad. Thank you. I know it's complicated and I'm asking you to sum things up in small little sound bites, but um, it's always interesting for us readers to hear kind of what's behind the poems. Um, some of your poems put me in mind of the great Turkish modernist Nazim Hikmet how joy and longing are so often entwined in his, for instance, his famous Things I Didn't Know I Loved. Do you think of your poems as illuminating these paradoxes of the heart, joy and longing, joy and loss? Uh, you are talking about like, uh, my poems are about uh, what? Well, I'm really, um, when I read your poems, kind of when I'm going through the whole book, I see often the recognition of grief and loss and longing for the longing for your homeland. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, there's this immediacy of recognition of where you are in the present moment and sometimes connection with other human beings, sometimes with uh, the built landscape, sometimes the natural landscape. And there's this sort of enmeshment, I feel, that goes on throughout the book. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that impulse in your writing. Yeah, I think uh, I, did, I didn't only write about uh, the loss and grief I went through. Also, I wrote about uh, my life here in the USA. Uh, you know, we all every day we try to connect with other people. That is our basically uh, way to work. And uh, in like any relationship, uh, work at home or outside. And uh, here I, I live in Pittsburgh, uh, it's totally different culture uh, and different language. So like cultural, there are a lot of cultural differences and that gives me also loneliness. Sometimes it's try to uh, separate me uh, to, from other people or other uh, of this context. So, but my goal is to uh, go out and make connection with the people and try to uh, find out my uh, way to get around or my freedom and uh, that's it. So, yeah, so in, in my poem, I also talk about uh, the comfort I got here. You can see in my, this poems are basically uh, past two years or three years of my all poems. You can find, uh, I think, uh, the wandering uh, freedom in this country, I think, and uh, a lot of like uh, diversity I have uh, seen. So you can find uh, those things in my uh, poems. Yes, I, I feel that um, it's really easy to connect emotionally to your images and the conversational kind of intimate voice that you bring into your poems. I'm wondering if you will share uh, some more um, poems with us and uh, continue reading for a bit to him. So when I hear from Excel poems, Pardon me? Do, do you wanna hear from Excel poems? Um, yes, please. Okay, just give me one second.
Yeah, so I, I have uh, another two poems. Uh, this one is the part of Excel poems, but uh, first line is I am Icarus. So what, one evening uh, I wake up uh, from my sleep and suddenly I was uh, feeling a sense of exile and like I was feeling I am uh, Icarus. And I was trying to touch my like wings and I didn't find it was some kind of uh, like living in from your home country to a far land like uh, those feelings. I am Icarus. I was given those famous wings. They have fallen because of some lying scenes. A pair of delicate silken wings, even the scars marking where they are attached to my shoulders, vanished long ago. Only when I wake up from an afternoon slumber, for a few moments I am reminded of my wings. When I touch my shoulders, I get no response. All I hear in my head is the sound of currents running through the waves of what is remembered. Like neurons that keep groping for memories of things that happened a million years ago. From the window, I gaze at the sky, a world before the solar eclipse. Like an agony, all I remember is I am Icarus. I was given those famous wings Alas, I have lost my plump, fleshy, silken pair of wings. So this is the poem uh, I'm going to read. Uh, this is so from 2013, 2015, there are uh, several writers who are uh, killed by Bangladesh Islamic militants. So he is the Bangladesh, he is Bangladesh American uh, atheist writer Obujit Roy, and I wrote this poem about him. The militants killed the free thinker in the darkness of faith, but he isn't alone now. On the shores of many vast oceans. I see the giant water columns going to him. He has no complaints, clutching his throat with one hand every day he holds his glass out to us with the other. The more the days pass, the more he shines like a star in our wide sky of knowledge, glowing with his own luster. They wanted to kill me too. They wanted to bath me in blood. Such blind equations and injustice will make the rivers dry up, make the flowers wilt before sunset. Holding their pens, the writers of my country hold their heads high. I think for now I have these two poems, Alison. Um, I see you're displaying um, one of your wonderful drawings. Mm -hmm. And um, in a minute, let's talk about your drawings and your choice to sometimes use illustrations instead of words. Right now, I'd like to um, ask you a question that's in the Q&A. It's a wonderful question. In the poetry that you read, does the word country contain a visceral meaning in a way that would not exist in a word such as nation? Uh, I think this is a great question and uh, also a tough question too. <laughs> and uh, country, I think uh, country has a some kind of, uh, I feel like bigger meaning. This country is not just Bangladesh, I think, or not, not USA. It's like a, maybe smaller than the world, but, 
And country is not only a physical land for me. Country is a like a place to our psychological a, a space where I live in. I think sometimes country and the word home are maybe similar, you know. I, I do a lot of juggling from home and country. Yeah, like I am living here almost uh, more than uh, five years. So I feel like this is my country too. And I, I have another country too, two country I have. I have a Bengali, I live in a Bengali uh, world, in a different world. I have my own uh, Bengali poetry, Bengali song, Bengali movies. So that is a totally different part of uh, country. Uh, nation, uh, it could be maybe uh, national, nationalism, maybe those can, we can describe those things by that word. And I think, yeah, but country has a bigger meaning that nation is for me, is for, uh, this is my totally like personal uh, understanding maybe. That's beautiful. Um, in fact, that mirrors a question that I was going to ask how you define home. And I think you've pretty much touched on that. So I'll go on to ask you about this drawing and collage. If there's anything you would like to uh, expand on what, what we're looking at and your choice for putting this in the book. Yeah, so I think that uh, when I was uh, thinking about this event and I, I was thinking, oh, this is a great opportunity to talk about uh, showing my drawings. And uh, yeah, I, I, I uh, try to use the most usefulness of pen. Like I write and I, this, these are basically ballpoint uh, drawing and I do uh, black and white. So in my drawing, uh, like sometimes I, I, I use uh, so many genre, I write uh, poems, I, I write uh, novel, I write novellas, short stories, uh, articles, but still I feel there are so many, uh, there, there are other feelings I cannot express in my writing and also sometimes I, uh, though I think I do not have writer's block because uh, I'm doing uh, different things, but still sometimes uh, I feel like the world is very, very hard or something. I cannot produce any work. So then I start drawing and also it takes time to uh, get together uh, so many shapes. Like I have some favorite shapes. Uh, if you see, I have like, uh, my favorite shapes are uh, face, uh, animal and uh, they're like eyes. So I, try, I use them and it's not only uh, you can see, not loneliness, I want to say uh, doors of happiness. Uh, drawing gives me uh, like calmness. So I uh, do, uh, I try to uh, draw that those shadows uh, of light and also like maybe, you know, our expression or our feeling change a lot in like in five, five seconds, if you see meme artist, their expression, they can change their expression within 10 seconds in 10 different forms. So our emotions are like that. So I try to uh, draw or capture those emotions. And sometimes I write poetry and try to uh, draw a translation, means a drawing but I feel like totally it's become a different thing, the different art and creativity. It's um, always fascinating to encounter work in both those uh, disciplines, those media, and to really start thinking sort of what are the intersections between the text and the drawing, and it's very generative for your readers. Um, <clears throat> forgive me, but I, I I'm forgetting um, whether or not you've read sections from letters from Sampsonia Way. Have, have you read any of those sections with 
that's a wonderful um, cycle. And I'm wondering if you could read from letters from Samsonia Way. Thank you. Uh... Sorry, just uh, miss that. So, like uh, during during my time in USA for the last five years, I have had to uh, endure exile and uh, also pandemic. So, despite facing uh, so many challenges, uh, I recognize that I have been able to exercise freedom of creative freedom of uh, expression. But, but uh, in the time of pandemic, it was hard. It was like double exile. Uh, over the days and nights of the pandemic, I, com I composed a seri new series of poems. And uh, a few of these poems are presented here in uh, which I try to uh, come, like capture a glimpse of life. Uh, like, like I, we are isolated in the time of uh, pandemic. And also I didn't write about basically Herpesburg. I, write, I wrote about uh, that part of world where I am from, Bangladesh, uh, India, South Asian nation. Basically these poems are uh, part of uh, making, uh, marking this moment uh, in time project uh, that made possible by a grant from Heinz Endowment. I'm going to read some of poems there. Days of the pandemic, Kenneth and I are walking on Lafayette Avenue. A woman working in her garden calls out to us, good evening. The dog barks on the stairs, a clear blue sky above, cars parked in a row on the road, everyone's at home. On such winter evenings, back in my country, I would play badminton, I remember. In this poem I talked about Kenneth, he is one of my best friend in Pittsburgh. Two, on surreal corona days, I watched from the window the bald trees have started sprouting leaves. In just two days, the bare branches are full. This year, the cold days were late to arrive, which is perhaps why they are leaving late too. In the afternoons, I want to go to Crazy Mocha for tea with the neighbor who asked after me in an email. How much longer? will we have to wait for one another's embrace? Three, I was born in Bangladesh. For on suspicion of corona, a son has abandoned his mother on the street. Oh, my homeland, so full of heroes, still I cannot forget you. I try to find my country somewhere in my stamp collection. Four, I can hear the neighbors' dogs barking. They are growing impatient. We are growing impatient too, quarreling with friends on text. <laughs> then they're making up by sending books bought online. <laughs> My work colleagues no longer drink <laughs> wine during happy hours. <laughs> Every day feels like a holiday. Every day is Saturday or maybe Sunday. The nights are dark and long. In the middle of one exile, I live in another one, frozen in surprise. No hope of thaw. Five, on India's highways, thousands of migrant laborers are walking homewards. They have no money or enough food no medicines, their feet wrapped in plastic bags are cracked and bleeding. The mother pulls the luggage with a rope, the child lying on it. Fear is written on their faces. 
Yesterday they learned 16 exhausted laborers had fallen asleep on the rail line. A train ran over them. Their severed bodies soaked in blood lay like pieces of dry flat bread made of wheat. A tragic joke. After walking nearly 90 miles over three days in the forest of Maharashtra, teenager Jamlo Magdom died when she was just an hour away from home. Filmmaker Vinod Kapri cruised with his camera alongside seven laborers walking from Delhi to Bihar to capture their lives on celluloid. It, it is easy to leave any short of home but returning is difficult, at times impossible. I can tell this now from my life, own life. There's so many stunning images and um, I, would, I was impressed by how you managed to inject some humor and bring us back also to the very serious and some oftentimes tragic um, his events that you, you talk about. And I think there's great humanity in that, that you're able to do both within one poem. Um, I'd like to ask you a couple of craft questions for those of us who um, love to really dig deep into the, the, the poet's um, creative process. Um, so one of my questions, let me see if I can find it here. Um, oh, pardon me, I've misplaced my questions. Um, I noticed that in many of the poems, and I had the chance to read the whole manuscript, which was a delight, um, the uh, birds and trees populate many of the um, the, the poems in your book. Uh, for me, they suggest flight, transformation, song, rootedness, fragility, domesticity, geography, so much more. And I, would, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your choice to use these repeated references <clears throat> to birds and trees throughout the manuscript. How did you settle on that particular aesthetic choice? I think uh, it is also about my childhood. Uh, I was very close to nature uh, in my childhood. Uh, there is a, like a, a big uh, sort of ju jungle, it's like a jungle <laughs> near our uh, houses and uh, in our neighborhood. And we, the kids used to go and play there. So I spent a lot of time there. And, and also I am from Borishal. Uh, this is a, Borishal is a city from, the southern part of uh, Bangladesh, and the city is uh, crisscrossed by rivers and canals, and also it's a very very green city with trees. So, and you know, so I grew up uh, with that uh, in that atmosphere. So when I did uh, come here in Pittsburgh, and I was thinking basically, oh, I'm going to USA. It's maybe everywhere there is a high rise buildings. So I had an impression like that to, by watching Hollywood movies or something like that. But when I did come to Pittsburgh, I got a, like a, my first view was I got, I just uh, released my breath and I saw the trees and I was very happy to see greenery here. So, I write uh, not only uh, political poems, I write also uh, abstract poems. And uh, these abstract poems are very different. And it's like, uh, I write about our connections between human and uh, object, human and uh, nature. So, and when I did come here, I uh, went to the river for Solas, uh, like Morongahila rivers or Allegheny rivers, Wahio rivers. 
and I spent uh, my past two years when I was writing uh, this manuscript. Uh, I was writing a lot all that uh, as a full-time writer and I was spending uh, a lot of time writing and went to the parks and uh, I feel like I'm still uh, in Borishal, but I'm not, but I was trying to understand those, uh, and to get that feelings from um, the trees and uh, the plants. So yeah, in my poetry, in my abstract poems, uh, there is a big part of uh, birds also, and, uh, and uh, plant or trees. They, uh, by that uh, I express, uh, like those are like vessels, you know, I try to express my feelings through the, those vessels. Yeah, I, I feel um, so much emotion coming through those and it, it changes and progresses um, in the different contexts. So I, I took a lot of pleasure in following that. Uh, we have a, another really wonderful question from one of our audience members. And this requires you to put on your historian's hat. Uh, Bangladesh, the nation of Bangladesh, was such a hopeful moment in world history. The fight against imperialism, the fight for women's rights, the progressive constitution, the multi-ethnic Bangla identity. What happened? How is Islamic fundament, fundamentalism taken hold? I think this is a great question. And uh, we, Bangladesh is a we have uh, a long history of secularism for 1,000 years. Like our literature uh, is 1,000 years old. So, but, and also uh, we, the Bang Bengali people, uh, we fought a liberation war in 1971. Uh, like all Hindus or other, all different religious groups, they fought, uh, the war together for to get their freedom, and also they have participated uh, all of their uh, the cultural programs. But there are also uh, other people who misinterpret the religion, and uh, they try to uh, build an atmosphere of fear. By that, those people who believe uh, those ideology they can go to power. I think this, this kind of mentality played a role. It's not only inside Bangladesh, it's also outside a uh, few uh, Islamic countries, they are uh, giving support and also money to, by that they build Islamic schools where uh, near 4 million uh, dangerous racist uh, students are growing up. They are just, reading like from 100 or 200 years ago uh, syllabus. So, and yeah, but all Bangladeshis are not uh, Islamist, you know. They, they are, there are secular people. Uh, also, uh, there are other people who uh, practice their own religion uh, and do their life. But, uh, Still, like uh, there are those people who try to uh, come in power, and uh, but basically, they, those people thought we, the writers and activists, uh, who are the who tell the truth, they are their main uh, obstacle because, like in 1970, war one without a war, there are like 3 million, 3 million people who are killed by Pakistan army. There are some people who are our own, own people in our community member, they help them, help Pakistan army. So the, those are traitor and we demanded uh, a trial for them, against them, for that they targeted us, like the writers and poets and activists, and they labeled us, you are atheists. But I am saying there are more people who are practice uh, secularism 
it's still secularism and uh, live their own life. They don't, general people don't support them totally. Yeah, I, I um, <clears throat> in preparation for having this chat with you, I tried to do a little bit of research into uh, your country's history uh, very superficially. And I saw how things kept moving back and forth between different kinds of, uh, you know, sort of government takeover. And there was so much tumult and change over over a short span of time. I was, I was like, trying to say basically like all Bangladesh people like, not like Afghanistan, like I feel like uh, the, like 20 years of war, but I think the Afghan male, male Afghans, they didn't change that much. So the situation in Bangladesh is not like that. So I was trying to say basically that. But I, we could say like there are a lot of progress for, uh, for women rights or women in Afghanistan, but in Bangladesh, uh, there are other peoples who are practicing uh, religion in their way, in a peaceful way, and uh, they're part of the uh, community too. Um, I'm going to ask you to read, um, I think we have time for um, Blaze Night Lion and Storytelling Tree, but before you read these, um, I want to ask you if your readers tell you that you are a master of the last line whether in a stanza or in a poem. I find your final lines absolutely stunning. I don't know if that's something you hear from your readers. So do you wanna hear uh, those poems? Yes, I was asking the question, have other people told you that the final line in your stanza is amazing? That your last lines that you write are so stunning and impactful, uh, they just, you, uh, I'm reading along in the stanza and then you'll come in with a final line that just absolutely changes the whole direction of what came before. It's just masterful. So I wanted to say that before you read these last poems and also to tell you um, what a pleasure and privilege it has been getting acquainted with your work and with you. So um, why don't you close us out with other, uh, these two other poems, Blaze, Night, Lion and Storyte storytelling tree. Thank you. Uh, I want to say like uh, for those uh, one-liner at the end of the poem, yeah, I try to project a, like a uh, philosophy there by that uh, people can get a open space to think about more. So uh, let's read then. But I think I am going to read one poem uh, in English and one poem in Bengali. Then people can hear my sound, Bengali That's sound. Lovely. That's lovely. Thank you. Blaze Night Lion. When a lion blazes above the night air, he lifts up again and again, his body on fire. I don't rush to him with water. In my head, I say, blaze lion, blaze more, burn it all as you blaze. The smell of burning main spread within myself. The full moon makes things brighter. Me, who am I? I came to this prairie a long time ago. I stayed. My shoes covered in grass, moss on my body. I am a night human, a writer who has written nothing in a long time, who only sits alone and watches the lion blazing above, above the night air. Yeah, this poem was about basically writer's block. Storytelling today. I'm going to read in Bengali. O Golpabola Gach, Tomar Jono Daria Taki, Shonda Sheshe. Chukti Kore, Pataniche Deke, Dalture Dakao, Rongberonger Paki. 
ও গল্প বলা গাছ আমার বুকে যে পাখিরা ঘুমোয় ওদের গল্প কি জানো তুমি জাদু জানো Uh, Tuin, it's so wonderful to hear those poems and also to hear you reading in Bengali at the end. Um, and thank you for also giving us the, the English as well. So we're listening and uh, reading um, alongside. Um, uh, I want to, as we turn to our last 15 minutes with everybody, um, think about the, uh, the context of the city of, of asylum in Pittsburgh, um, if we may. And um, we have a wonderful um, question um, from uh, the, the Q&A. Um, and I will say to, to audience members, if you have questions for Tuin about his work, um, about what it means to be a poet in, in, in 21st century global spaces or, or, or anything about the, the City of Asylum project. There is still time to put a question in the question and answer. Um, but this one asks you to think about your house a little bit to it, if you don't mind. Um, the, the question is, your house is being painted with Bangla letters. There will be that imagery of a Bangla language sanctuary on Pittsburgh's north side. So what message is that sending to people in Bangladesh and in the Bangla diaspora? Um, and it might help if you can um, maybe give a little context for those who aren't, aren't on Pittsburgh's north side and don't know about this to, to say a little bit about why your house is being painted with Bangla letters right now and, and what that looks like. Yeah, like, uh, as you know, there are some houses on Samsonia Way at City of Asylum. Uh, those houses are uh, a part of uh, City of Asylum House Publication Projects, uh, where uh, exile writers contributed their thoughts and they uh, drew uh, the house. So you can find on Samsonia Way, uh, Burma House, uh, there was a writer from uh, Bar Burma or Myanmar, uh, she was living there and uh, she and uh, her husband uh, created that uh, mural. It was a part of a uh, project of City of Asylum. There are also like other houses like Jazz House, uh, Winged House, uh, China House, House Poem, but it was uh, painted by uh, City of Asylum's first uh, exile writer who was from China. So I was... Uh, commissioned uh, by City of Asylum to uh, uh, create a new house publication for them. And uh, basically, uh, in the still we are working on it, uh, in the process of making design, uh, I, I have, uh, I was thinking about putting uh, Bengali letters on the house and other uh, drawings, uh, those are related to and color basically. I, I already this, the house is painted in uh, green and red. Yeah, message, uh, as I was talking about these things before because uh, I, uh, I was talking about that greatest language movement in Bangladesh, uh, who are like so many people got killed. And uh, that, is, that is the International Mother Language Day is, uh, that is 21st of February. So that means, and also like after that even happened in 1952, after seven, almost 70 years, that was the fight for freedom of expression. Like the Pakistani rulers said, you cannot talk in uh, Bengali, you have to talk their language in Urdu. But we said, it's my mother language. How can I talk other language? So after that struggle, uh, after 70 years, in 2013 to 2015, there is a, like a killing spree of writers. Like total 19 writers got killed by Islamic extremists in Bangladesh from, from 2013 to 2015. It's over 50 people uh, were killed by uh, 20 of them, 19 or 20 of them writers. And that was a he was uh, like, uh, it was a, a big attack on. Uh, freedom of expression. So I was thinking, uh, and I am here. So I was thinking I can tell this two a story together in the United States. Then people can learn about uh, International Mother Language Day and also the struggle the writers are doing for their own community uh, that should be appreciated in this country because 
This country is also built by uh, so many immigrant, immigrants who are speaking in different languages at home. So that was basically my idea to uh, promote uh, those Bengali letters also. Thank you. That is a, a wonderful answer and, and wonderful context. And um, I will put the link, hopefully people can see the link in the chat, but I put the link in the chat to the City of Asylum's house publications, um, because it was a new concept to me as we started out in this project that you could publish a house um, and that you could read a house. And so there is the video on YouTube of Hua Xiang um, reading his house to people. Um, uh, and one of the things that's really amazing about that story and about the City of Asylum Pittsburgh story is the way that um, it's been a way to have people gather. And I think that's very true in your answer to and about the, the sense of, of people coming together and, and perhaps we're learning about history, perhaps we're learning about culture, but we're also reflecting on our own history and culture, maybe our own relationships to our mother language. Um, and so- Yeah, um, like, yeah, it, is not, it, is, it is like a house library, you know? <laughs> I love that. I love that, right? Um, and and it is on, um, on, 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 you know, these houses are all on Samsonia Way, um, and bringing in many art forms. Um, what, um, if you don't mind, um, what is the experience of being on the north side, being in Pittsburgh, um, finding a community being like? Because obviously you've been very generative as a writer, um, but it's it's clear you've also found a community of, of people in Pittsburgh. Could you could you talk about that? Sure. Yeah, I think. Uh... Uh, I am glad I was accepted by this, uh, invited and accepted by this community as a uh, writer, not only just a, uh, yeah, as a writer. And uh, that was a huge, uh, I think huge thing and totally special for this special residency in that way. And living in, uh, so there are like, living in North Side is, uh, yeah, I like this neighborhood. Uh, I am here for five years now, and I am not, uh, I think, tired, I can say. I like, <laughs> I like it. And there is a huge park uh, near my neighborhood. That park uh, saves me. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of greeneries. Uh, people are nicer on the street. People say uh, hello. They smile, but I cannot uh, get that thing in New York, in bigger cities, you know. I do not get that, but I can get from my neighbors are uh, just people are walking by on the street. We don't know them. Yeah, and also other thing like in Pittsburgh, I did um, more than 100, uh, almost more, more than 100 events at different uh, universities, uh, uh, schools, colleges, and other uh, art organizations. So, so I, I was, uh, I'm getting uh, their support from this artist, com artist community in Pittsburgh, and I feel uh, welcoming here for my uh, for my self personally and also for art. That is a, that is a wonderful uh, answer to it. And um, what is clear about it is the, the reciprocity here, right? The, the things that you're able to give to the community through events and teaching and that the community is, is giving to you and, and the space, right? I love hearing about the sort of the park as the sustaining space and, and uh, how you're not tired of, of, of the neighborhood. Um, mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to end the, the evening on my own words, so I, I wonder, I'm not, this is not throwing you uh, a curveball, as, as, as the phrase I've learned since moving to the US is, but um, uh, would you have one short final poem or excerpt you'd feel you could read for us, or is that um, too much of a swerve at the end? Uh, sure, just to give me one second to pull it up. Certainly will. Um, after Tuin, while Tuin is finding this um, uh, this poem and, and getting set up, um, I put the link to the rest of the series um, in the event. Um, we'll let Tuin's words close us out. Um, uh, the um, the next event will be on Thursday, October the twenty first. First, 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. It's called Composing Music, Creating Places. Um, it's going to think again about Pittsburgh and Rochester and our shared strengths in music as a way to showcase the cultural events that lead to creative placemaking. Um, it's going to feature a performance by May Coy, who's known as Vietnam's Bjork, and she's a current resident at the City of Asylum, Pittsburgh. Um, it'll also feature the um, uh, conductor, Andres Franco, moderating. Um, and we'll also be able to welcome Armand Hall from Rock Music in Rochester. Um, to in, um, whenever you're ready. Sure.
little funny poem. <laughs> Keeping you waiting with a comma. A row of pine trees standing in a poem, dangling dewdrops, clutching the fingers of the winter nurse. And December from last year is still flowing. Several rows of bars making the world wet with a comma. The mouth of some distant cave is opening now. And that is another great example of the way you, you end these poems with those wonderful last lines and a great last line uh, to end on. Um, I'd like to thank um, Alison Myers for being here. I'd like to thank especially Tuan Das for being here. Um, I'd like to thank Roberta Schwartz for uh, her wonderful introduction and her wonderful efforts. Um, you can get it uh, in contact with us in a number of places, um, including through um, uh, Mumra Community College and um, uh, SUNY Geneseo. Um, uh, and um, we hope to welcome you back for future events. Thank you all for being here this evening and good evening. Thank you so much for having me.